that he could see them, and, and, and he asked for anyone who wanted to accept Christ as their personal savior, they should just raise their hand. So the missionary said everybody heard him, everybody raised their hand. So the missionary concluded that everyone in these villages got eternal life, was going to heaven. You know, I, I mean, you know, I've heard people going door to door and telling the people that, look, God is offering you eternal life for free, just like God is offering a million dollars for free. But who wouldn't like to have a million dollars for free? So eternal life is more valuable than a million dollars. So why not just say, say this simple prayer and get eternal life for free? So these type of invitations to get eternal life are not what it means to have eternal life. And this is the chapter and this is the portion where Jesus makes it very clear about this. What does it mean to have eternal life? And, it, and, and, it, and, it, and it, it, if it was just as simple as raising your hand to an airplane overhead, or if it was just as simple as just accepting an offer to have eternal life like accepting to get million dollars for free, then there'd be no need for Jesus in this chapter to go into such depth about what it actually means to have eternal life. I mean, who doesn't want to get a million dollars for free? Who doesn't want to get eternal life for free? And the people that heard Christ, they also wanted eternal life for free. Yes, they said that in verse 34. Verse 34, it says, then they said unto him, Lord, evermore, Give us this bread of life. It means we eat the bread, we're going to live forever. So much misunderstanding about what it means to receive eternal life. This chapter, the one word that describes the subject of this chapter is the word life. It occurs 11 times in this chapter. This is a chapter explaining what it means to have eternal life. It's all about eternal life. Getting eternal life is the highest priority for a person. The highest priority should not be ignored. As Jesus said in verse 27, verse 27, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. And in this verse, Jesus said that it was a free gift that he would give, and it needed to be the highest priority in people's lives. Giving eternal life wasn't just a side interest of Jesus. He was sent to earth to give this gift of eternal life. He says that in verse 33. Verse 33, the bread of God is he which come down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So what is this eternal life? He uses many and several different words or pictures to describe. One of them in verse 35, verse 35, he describes eternal life as a coming to Jesus. Verse 35, verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. Eternal life means a looking at or a beholding with, it, with, it, with, a, with, a, with a, a, a look of trust in Christ. As he said in verse 39, verse 39, this is the Father's will which is sent me. That of all which you have given me, I should lose nothing, he, but that he opened it, should raise it out again in the, the last day. Like Just like those Israelites, yeah, they were bit by the snakes. I, I, I know they had the poisonous venom in them. They had to behold this brass snake on a pole, lift it up. They had to believe that, obeying God and looking intently at that snake and believing that that would heal them. That's what they had to do to live and not die. Eternal life he describes as a, not a believing in, but a believing, well, the King James says believing on, but really in the Greek it's believing into Christ in verse 47, verse 47. Verily, verily I say unto you, he that believeth on or into me has eternal life. Eternal life is, is he, he, he paints a picture of bread and he says, look, take this bread and you make you, you eat it you bring it into you he says that's eternal life he says in, in verse 48 48 uh, verse 48 I am that bread of life eternal life is believing that the body or the flesh of Jesus Christ was broken for our sins as he said in, in verse 51 verse 51 I am the living bread which came down from heaven if any man eat of this bread 
he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And now he's trying to, to, to paint a picture of how eternal life is to be very close to Jesus Christ. And he uses an analogy here, which, which really, to be honest, it offended many people. It, it, it shocked. It was a shocking analogy. But he's using the analogy of eating and drinking to stay alive, to symbolize Jesus Christ inside of you. As he says in verse 53, verse 53, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Eternal life, he described, it's not something in the future. It's not something you'll get later. It's a right now event that a person could know if he has it by knowing if he's really taking Jesus Christ into him. In verse 54, this is verse 54, he that eateth my flesh, drink my blood, has eternal life, and I'll raise him up the last day. So using this analogy, he's, on, he's locked onto this analogy of eating and drinking to stay alive. Like a person would say, I'm starving to death, give me food and drink or I'll die. And he's saying that a person says, give me Christ or I'll die. And so, and then he goes on and he, he, he says, look, it's about the words of Christ. He says it's taking the words of Christ inside of you. And he says in verse 63, verse 63, it's a spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, their spirit, they are life. Eternal life comes through the words of Christ, which is what Peter said in verse 68, verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So he, he, he's trying to clarify, and there's many clarifications in this chapter about eternal life. And in order for there to be an understanding that eternal life is more than just signaling to an airplane that a person wants eternal life, this chapter clarifies that a person doesn't get eternal life from just repeating a, a prayer at a doorstep. All of these explanations about what it means to have eternal life. Jesus was speaking in, in the center of the Jewish religion, in the synagogue. It says that in verse 59, as we saw, verse 59. And he's doing, what he's doing in the synagogue, it says in verse 59, he taught in the synagogue. He's teaching. He's teaching. He, he, he's teaching. He's teaching about what people didn't know, which is what is eternal life. And in this teaching, he's using analogies to make people understand what it means, especially this aspect, I'm starving to get, give me food or a, a drink or I'll die. He's driving this home. Now when Jesus said that eating his flesh was, was to have eternal life, what we read in verse 52, the response was this, verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They argued. They didn't agree. When Jesus said this, used this analogy, I, I've got to have Jesus like i got to have food or I'll die. That's when the Bible describes in verse 52 a division and an argument. The Jews therefore struggle among themselves. This is a division that happened among the Jews. Two sides, this side, that side. There were two sides and they argued with each other. On one side were the Jews who were for Jesus and they were willing to, to cut Jesus slack to give him the benefit of the doubt when he used this analogy of his flesh-like food that had to be eaten to stay alive. That's one side. Then the other side were Jews who were against Jesus, and they were just standing there ready to blame Jesus for using this analogy of Jesus as, as important as daily food stay alive. So, 
Some of the Jews were for Jesus, some of the Jews were against Jesus. The two sides, the two sides argued with each other. They were not unanimous in their position. And this division among the Jews over Jesus seen today, and it was seen then. The Jews who were against Jesus, which for sure is the majority, that's the majority. They're the ones who say no Jew believes in Jesus, but that's not true. Because there is a very small group of, uh, of, of Jews who were not against Jesus. The majority are Jews against Jesus, but the small majority are Jews for Jesus. <laughs> and this was seen and in in, in commented on in the overall comment about Jesus and the Jews in John 1.11. John 1.11. Two verses. John 1.11 and 12. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It's very easy to only read verse 11. In John 1. It's a comment about the Jews and say, okay, Jesus came to his own Jewish people and his own Jewish people did not receive him, period, end of story, stop. But that's not the complete picture. Because when verse 11 is read just by itself, then it's like verse 12 steps in and says, hold on, hold on here. That's not the complete picture that Jesus came to his own Jewish people and they rejected him. Verse 12 steps in with the giant, but as if to say, that's not all the Jews because there's another group. It's small, but it's real. It's there. And verse 12, John 1, 12, John 1, 12, verse 12 calls that other group of Jews the as many as received him group. And that many as received him, it's a very real group of Jews who are the, who are the, but as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's what we're seeing now in, in chapter 6, verse 52, verse 52. We're seeing those two groups of Jews, where one group of Jews in verse 52 are the John 1.11 group, received him not. And the other group of Jews in verse 52 are the John 1, 12 group of received him Jews. And what we see in verse 52 is a great conflict between the received him not Jews and the received him Jews and they're arguing with each other. They're arguing over what Jesus meant they're arguing over verse 52, verse 52, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now we can understand a little bit of how this statement, eat his flesh, it's a hard statement. We can understand, it's difficult to understand. Yes, it's a hard statement. Let's face it. Clearly, Jesus is not talking literally about eating his flesh and as they received him, uh, not group of Jews were saying, he's talking about cannibalism. Jesus was not speaking literally about eating his flesh because Jesus used the present tense in verse 51, verse 51, except you eat, you now eat the flesh of the Son of Man and, and drink his blood, and now drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those are present tense verbs. Where Jesus is saying in verse 53, verse 53, except you right now, right now are eating the flesh of Jesus and right now are drinking the blood of Jesus. You don't have right now eternal life. Now obviously, Jesus was standing there in front of them at that time and talking about a right now eating of his flesh and a right now drinking his blood. No one was literally eating the flesh of Jesus at that time, and no one was literally drinking the blood of Jesus. So, <clears throat> obviously, Jesus is not speaking about literally eating his flesh and literally drinking his blood, but the Roman Catholic Church has a doctrine 
in their sacrament of the Mass that the wafer that the Catholic priest gives and the wine that the Catholic priest dispenses during the Mass be, literally become the flesh and blood of Jesus. They call that transubstantiation. That's why the Catholic Mass is a perversion of the Lord's Supper, which is obviously wrong. As a matter of fact, a Catholic janitor one time came out of the deception of the Catholic Church when he was cleaning the, the Catholic Church, and he found a, under a pew a wafer that the Catholic priest had dispensed from Mass, and it was covered in mold. And the Catholic janitor realized that, that that wafer could not have become the flesh of Jesus, but the Bible says that God was not going to allow Jesus to see corruption. From that this discovery, that Catholic, that, that, that former Catholic janitor was delivered and came out of the Catholic um, deception. Now, John 1.11, received him not, group of Jews, were prejudiced against Jesus. And when Jesus spoke of this analogy of eating his flesh, that group says, aha, it's just what I thought. Jesus is wrong. Reminds me of a Jewish rabbi that I was speaking with one time, and he said to me, Jesus sinned. I said, when was that? He said, well, because he didn't obey his mother and father when he was 12 years old, and he separated from them to dispute with the scholars of the temple. He was told, his, told his parents he had to be out of his father's business. Uh, I, I told the rabbi, I said, yeah, when you're really looking for a way to be saved from your sins and go to heaven, I said, give me a call. I said, because to say that Jesus sinned is a non-starter, and it's not going to get you to heaven. But for sure, what Jesus said in verse 52 about eating his flesh, it's a hard saying. And the first step to dealing with a hard saying in the Bible is to say, I don't understand it. I don't understand it, but I trust that Jesus is not saying something wrong. I just need to get an understanding. And when a person takes that position, it's likely that God will give that person an understanding of what Jesus meant. But when a person takes the position, he said, I knew it, he's a bad person, then for sure God is not going to give that person an understanding of what it meant. And Jesus explained all this in, in, in Mark 4.11. Mark 4.11, when Jesus said, he said unto them, Jesus said unto them, Mark 4.11, Unto uh, you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of, heaven, of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and, 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 and their sins should be forgiven. Actually, this issue of being so close to Jesus that it's like eating his flesh it was actually taught by God at the Passover. At the Passover. There were two things that were to be done with the Passover lamb. And we think of the Passover lamb, we think the Passover lamb, okay, what's the Passover? Ah, oh, you just killed them. They just killed the lamb and they put the blood on the doorpost to save the house from death. Save the house from the death of the firstborn. End of story. Finished. Done. Okay, that's it. But that's not the only thing that was to be done with the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb was not just to die and have his blood applied to the doorposts, and then that was it. There was one more thing that had to be done with the Passover lamb. And God said what had to be done further with the Passover lamb in Exodus 12, 7. Exodus 12, 7. They shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house, houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat it not of it raw, nor sun it all with water, and roast with fire, his head, his legs, pertness thereof, shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. Passover lamb did die and its blood was applied to the doorpost to save the family from death. Yes. But that was not it. The meat 
of the Passover lamb, the meat of the Passover lamb, had to be eaten. All of it had to be eaten that night. And the eating of all the Passover lamb was a very important teaching message because Christ is called in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, correct, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, he's called Christ our Passover is sacrifice for us. He's called our Passover lamb. And just as the Passover lamb not only saved the people from death with his blood, the Passover lamb was totally taken into the saved people when they ate it, all of it. And looking back at that complete consumption of the Passover lamb, Jesus now uses an analogy of eating his flesh to have eternal life. And what God was teaching in that all-important part of the Passover, by having the, household, having the household eat all of the lamb, was that the lamb was important to them. The lamb was just not simply to give his body and his blood for that one-time event of saving them from death. The lamb was to become like a part of them, a part of the, each person as everybody ate all of the lamb. I mean, think of it. Think of the individuals in that household. They had all just experienced how death and the blood of that lamb had saved them from that death. And they were, they, they were not just disposed to get rid of the, the lamb now. And, and they, they weren't just to say, well, okay, that's all we needed from this lamb, so let's just dispose of the body and, and the remaining blood of that lamb. And keep in mind that, that when they ate that lamb, that was before any kosher laws were given about not eating blood. They didn't remove the blood from that lamb as it later done for the, the kosher. They ate the blood with the lamb meat. It means that they would have eaten the lamb meat with the blood of the, in, in, in the meat that, 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 that we typically eat today makes the meat red. It was a very emotional night. In, in, in which the families, they heard these awful shrieking screams from all the other Egyptian houses. They didn't put the blood of any lamb on their doorposts. Exodus 12, 30, Exodus 12, 30. Exodus, uh, Pharaoh, rose up er, Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. But all those families heard that great Exodus 12, 30, Exodus 12, 30, cry, shrieking cry throughout all the land of Egypt because there were all those dead firstborns in those houses that didn't have any blood on their doorposts. And then that family, the same family, looked at that dead body of that lamb with such a great measure of gratitude, appreciation, the lamb. The blood of that lamb saved them. And they didn't have a great big cry of, of agony in that house because of that, that lamb. And then that family would all gather around that lamb and cook it. And they would eat that lamb. And each person thought that Lanish Tana thought that why is this different? Why is this lamb different from all other lambs? The answer was obviously all other lambs were simply killed to feed our bodies with food. But this lamb is different from all other lambs because the blood of this lamb saved us from death in the home. Now as we eat this lamb, it's not just simply to give us food. We eat this lamb as a symbol of us wanting this lamb to become a part of us, with us. This is what God is teaching in this Passover by having the household eat all the lamb. It was the same thing that Jesus was te taught the disciples in the last Passover supper, where he had all his disciples do this. In Matthew 26, 26, Matthew 26, 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, 
and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. That last Passover supper, when Jesus took that bread and said in Matthew 26, 26, Matthew 26, 26, Take ye, this is my body. And when Jesus took that cup in Matthew 26, 27, 26, 27, said, Drink ye all of it. By saying those words, take ye, drink ye all of it, Jesus is saying, I'm the Passover lamb. And just as the blood of those Passover lambs that saved those houses from death, so my blood, which I will shed tomorrow on the cross, will save you from death and hell. I, he's saying, I am the Passover lamb. And just as those same families in Egypt were to eat all of the bodies of those dead lambs, blood and all, in those bodies and those body, and that was to become an integral part of the bodies of, of, of the family members so you are to eat this bread as if it was my body as if it was my flesh and you are to drink this wine as if it was my blood as a symbol of how I am to become an integral part of you and that's why Jesus said to his disciples at that last Passover Supper, everyone eat the bread, symbolizing his body, and the wine, symbolizing his blood. That's why he said, drink ye all of it. Now that momentous Passover night in Egypt, the one way back in time, in, in, in Egypt, these were the two very important parts that had to be done. They had to drink, they had to apply the blood, and they had to they eat the body and the lamb with the blood. Now, in order for that to happen for the, on, on the Passover night in Egypt, there were two parts that people had to follow. When you look at Exodus 12, it's really divided into two parts. Exodus 12 is divided into the first 27 verses. So the first 27 verses of Exodus 12 are verses of specific instructions that God gave to his people of what they had to do. The first 27 verses in Exodus 12 was God saying to the people, listen up. Because those were the instructions of how to select the land. Very specific instructions of the time they were to give to observe the land, to make sure it was qualified. Very specific instructions of the time they were to take uh, the lamb, uh, the one that time was they were supposed to take it out of its enclosure. Very specific instructions of when and how they were to kill the lamb. Very specific instructions of how they were to collect the blood of the lamb. Very specific instructions on how they were to apply or paint the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. Very specific instructions on how they were to cook the lamb beaten. Very specific instructions on how they were to eat all of the lamb and let, don't leave anything left over. Those are the first 27 verses of Exodus 12. Very specific instructions. And at the end of hearing all those instructions, we can imagine Moses saying to the people, got it? And we can imagine the people saying, got it. And by the way, we can imagine when Moses asked, got it? Uh, there were some on the peripheral, some very smart Egyptians who also cried out, got it! Because there was a group of Egyptians who we are told did follow the Jews out of Egypt in Exodus 12.38, Exodus 12.38, end of the chapter, Exodus 12.38, a mixed multitude went up also with them and flocks and herds and very much cattle. So that means that these very specific instructions on how to be saved from death of the Passover not, night was not restricted to just Jews. It was also open for any smart Gentiles that wanted to be saved from death that night because God gave a very clear warning of what would happen in Exodus 12.23. Exodus 12.23, this is the warning. The Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and not suffer the destroyer to come in into your house and to smite you. So the first thing that had to be done to be saved was, got it. 
where the people had to listen and hear and get all these specific instructions. But just the got it of hearing and understanding all those specific instructions was not enough for a person to be saved ultimately from this death. There was a very important second thing that had to be done, and that's verse 28. After all the instructions comes verse 28 of Exodus 12, Exodus 12, 28. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord commanded him, they commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. It's that word did. That was the did it part that was necessary for a person to be saved from death on the Passover night. Both parts are necessary to be saved. Both the got it and the did it had to be done to be saved from death. It was not enough for a person to listen very intently and understand the instructions on how to get the blood, how to apply it to the doors, because if a person knew how to apply the door, the blood on the doors, he if he got it, but there was no did it, he died. Or death came to that house. And in the same way, if a person is starving to death and he sees meat and he doesn't eat it, he dies. There had to be a did it, and there was in Exodus 12, 28. Exodus 12, 28. In the same way, there are many people in the got it group that listen and hear the gospel. Those people may have got it as a child going to church, but he's gone. Those people may have got it by regularly attending church. Those people may have got it by going to a Billy Graham crusade or by listening to a gospel preacher on radio or TV. But only to be a godded person of just getting the instructions of how to be saved from sins, the gospel, it's not enough for a person to be saved from the sins. Many very well-informed people are in hell today because they stopped at the godded step and they didn't go on to the did it step. And if asked if they understood the gospel, many people can say, got it. But if they asked if they did it, and only that person can truly know if he did it, if he actually received Christ, even though they might say that they have received Christ, just as one essential part of the did it, the Passover in Egypt, was the complete consumption of the Passover lamb to make that lamb a part of the person. So it is this one essential part of the did it for receiving Christ is to make Jesus Christ an integral part of the life, symbolized as if a person consumed the flesh, the body, the blood of Jesus, just like each family member in Egypt consumed all the body with the blood of the Passover lamb. This making Jesus an integral part of the life is what Jesus meant when he said in verse 52, verse 52. Oh, and it starts off, says, The Jews therefore strove among himself, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I accept you, I, 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 verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever drink, eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life. I'll raise them up the last day. These John 6 statements of consuming the flesh and blood of Jesus is understood when we look at Exodus 12 and the Passover and see the importance of consuming the flesh and the blood of the Passover land. These symbolic statements about consuming Jesus is what puts one word in the did it statement, and that word is I. I did it. When a person takes Jesus into them, like food is taken into him, that's a very personal act. And when Jesus becomes, and that's a, an act where Jesus becomes my Jesus, not just Jesus, but my Jesus. And this is what we see happening in the case of Thomas, where Thomas said in John 2028, John 2028. Thomas answered and said unto them, My Lord, and said unto him, rather, said unto Jesus, 
my Lord and my God. He didn't just say to Jesus, Lord and God. He said, my Lord and my God. And that one word, my, made all the difference in the world for Thomas. Because Thomas was not just saying, I know Jesus is Lord. I know Jesus is God. He didn't just say Jesus is Lord and God. He said Jesus is my Lord and my God. And when Thomas said that, Thomas said, I got it and I did it. That's a very searching question that everybody has to answer. Can I honestly say that I did it? Can I honestly say Jesus is my Lord and my God. Uh, in this chapter, Jesus clarified he was not talking about cannibalism. When he said in this cha chapter, it was necessary to eat his blood and drink his blood, uh, eat his flesh and drink his blood. What he said in verse 56, verse 56, he that does eat my flesh and he that does drink my blood is he that dwelleth in me and I in him. Now, Addison, uh, clarification of Tennyson, literally, verse 56, verse he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. So the call of Jesus is to a person, is the call of Jesus to a person is a call to get close, get so close to Jesus that Jesus lives inside a person. And that that person lives inside of Jesus, which is what Paul said when he meant, what he meant when he said in Galatians 2.20, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified, I personally, he didn't say personally, but I, but you can look at this one, I personally am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, I personally, I personally live. Yet not I. Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What Paul said in that verse, he was personally dead. But then he personally lived because Christ was living inside of him. He was explaining just how close he was to Jesus Christ. It reminds me when I, when I, uh, I, I, I at scuba diving, I, I got certified, I got trained certified in 1968 at scuba diving. I had scuba dive for 50 years after that. So my friend came along, so let's go scuba diving. I said, okay. And then the, the dive master said, when was the last time you were scuba diving? I said, two years ago. It was 50 years ago. <laughs> okay. Put this on. What was that? That's a BCD. What was that? Buoyancy compensating device. We didn't have those in 1968. We had weight belts. That was it. You wanted to go down, you put a weight on. You wanted to come up, you drop a weight. <laughs> okay. Anyway, a lot of new pieces of equipment that I faked it through until I figured it out. And all the while, the diving master says, "Come on, don't you remember in your training about this?" I go, oh, yeah. "There was no training about that because they didn't exist." One of the things that didn't exist at that time is called today the octopus system. What the octopus system is, is it's a second regulator on your air tank. So that if your buddy goes out of air, that you've got your own regulator, he's got his regulator, you don't share a regulator, and that. We didn't have that in 1968. So in 1968, we didn't have two regulators. For the one for the buddy, just one regulator. And for training, my diving buddy and I, in 1968, we went down under the water. And uh, and uh, then they said, okay, now I'm gonna train you. And so they, they turned off my air tank. And then we had to share a regulator, the, the mouthpiece, the regulator, as we came up. He would take a breath and then hold his breath and hand me the regulator. I would take the breath that I had, the old breath, blow out the salt water, take a breath, hand it back to him. That was the training. We came up. I needed him to breathe. 
I needed to stay close to him to breathe. I could not take a breath and then decide, well, I'll, I'll leave you now and go off over here. That's a picture of just how close we have to be to Jesus Christ in life. And I like that the analogy because in Genesis 2, it says that God breathed into man his breath and man got life. As we need to be as close to Jesus as having to take our next breath to stay alive. So when Jesus said in verse 56, verse 56, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. He's putting emphasis on life that is on a life that's described for a person as dwelling in Christ and Christ dwelling in that person. The Greek word for dwelling here, meno, it means staying with. And, and, and it's the idea to just, I had to stay close to my dive buddy to get air from his tank. So when we dwell in Christ, we have to stay close to him. This is the picture we have in Revelation 3.20. Revelation 3.20, where Christ says, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. In Revelation 3.20, Christ is seen standing at the door. That's the door of a person's heart. He stands there. Christ is standing there. He's not sitting outside the door. He's not like on a porch sitting there. He's outside the door, and he's standing there. He's standing there because, he, 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 because Christ wants to and expects to make the next move. And the next move is to go inside the door. The door represents a barrier to entering inside a house. There are two sides of the door, the inside and the outside, just like the children's song go. One door and only one, and yet its sides are two. Inside and outside, on which side are you? The fact that the Revelation 3.20 picture has a door sends the message that there is a barrier in front of our hearts. It's the door. The door is like a guard. It keeps unwanted intruders out from entering into our hearts. The door, of our heart, the, the door to the heart is a good thing because the door is a barrier that keeps out of the heart which should not be there. In Loretto, there's been some thefts in some homes. My neighbor had his cell phone and his wallet stolen from inside his house. Because of that, I'm a bit paranoid. I, I not only always, I not only, I not only always close the door, I lock it. Even if I'm going out to the garage building and I'm there, if there's no one in the house, I lock the door. Because I can imagine there's some bandito somewhere behind some bush that I can't see. He's watching, ready to slip into my unlocked door when I'm in the garage. For me, it's very important to close the door of the house. It's out of the house, unwanted intruders. This is the problem with drugs and alcohol intoxication. Drug Drugs and alcohol intoxication leave the door to the heart wide open where bad intruders can enter into the heart. In Revelation 3.20, the door of the heart is seen as closed. But in Revelation 3.20, Christ is seen as not just standing outside the door. He's not just passively there waiting for the door to open. He's active outside the door. He's knocking. The verb tense here for not in Revelation 3.20 doesn't in, just indicate it, that it's a one-time knock. He's standing there. This verb tense for knock is continuous. He's knocking and knocking and knocking on the door. He's persistent in his knocking. He knocks once, the door doesn't open. He knocks again and again and again until the door is open. We've all experienced a person at the door who rings the doorbell once, and that's it. And we go and answer the door. And then there's the people who ring the doorbell once, twice, three times, over and over and over again. That's what Christ is doing. And what do we do from inside the house when we hear the doorbell ringing and ringing and ringing? We say, okay, 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 I'm coming. 
we go to the door and open it. Christ knocks at the door over and over and over again. And the hymn says, God calling yet? Shall I not hear? Earth's pleasures shall I still hold dear? Shall life's swift passing years all fly and still my soul in slumber lie? God calling yet, shall I not rise? Can I his loving voice despise and basely his kind care repay? He calls me still, can I delay? God calling yet, and shall he knock and I my heart the closer lock? He's still waiting to receive and shall I dare his spirit grieve? And God calling yet, and shall I give? No heed. But still in bondage live, I wait, but he does not forsake. He calls me still, my heart, away. God calling yet, I cannot stay, my heart I yield without delay. Vain world, farewell, from thee I part. The voice of God has reached my heart. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice. That hymn of God calling yet could be named God knocking yet. Because that's what we see in Revelation 3.20. Christ knocking and knocking and knocking at the door of the heart because he wants to come inside. And then in Revelation 3.20, God Christ explains what he is wanting. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. It's a very important in that verse, Revelation 3.20, to see that Christ does not say that he will open the door. He's the Lord God Almighty. A closer of our heart, that's no obstacle for him. One flash of his eye, that door can be made a pile of ashes. He can make that door fall off its hinges. There be no door to barrier from him entering in, but he doesn't because he's not that kind of person. He has enabled each person to have a door to his heart. And Christ honors that door to each person's heart as the personal door of that person. He respects each person's decision to open or not open that door of his heart as Christ knocks and asks to be led into the heart. That's why it's so significant that Christ says in Revelation 3.20, Revelation 3.20, if any man hear my voice and open the door. That's the person who opens the door. There's only going to be one person's hand on that door handle. And Christ has made it clear, it will not be Christ's hand on that door handle. The only hand on that door handle will be the person's hand. Christ will only knock. He will not open that door. He will not let himself in to that person's heart. Each person has to make their own decision to open the door or not open the door of the heart. If a person decides to not open the door of his heart to Christ and that door of that person's heart stays closed to Christ. But Christ has said what he'll do if a person does open the door of the heart. He made a promise in Revelation 3.20. A Revelation 3.20 promise, I will come into him. That's a wonderful promise. Let's not overlook the wonder of that promise. Just imagine if a person did open the door of his heart and Christ didn't come in. How terrible that would be. But in Revelation 3.20, Christ said, If any man hear my voice and open the door. Any man, Christ said. Any Jew. Any Gentile. Any color man. Any race man. Any man of any status. Any man. That's Christ saying that he's calling every man. All men he's calling. Not just the Calvinistic elect men. All men. And he's promised that if a man will open the door of his heart, he'll come in. That means he will, Christ will step over the threshold from the outside to the inside. It means that there'll be a great change in the position of Christ to that person. Before a man opens the door of his heart, Christ is on the outside. He's within the realm of religion and church. But if a person opens the door of his heart to Christ, a great change happens of where Christ is. For that person, Christ steps out of the realm of religion, the church, and into the realm of reality. A reality expressed in Havergill's poem. Reality, reality, Lord Jesus Christ, thou art to me. 
from the spectral mist and driving clouds, from the shifting shadows and phantom crowds, from unreal words and unreal lives, where truth with falsehood feebly strives, from the passings away, the chance, the change, flickerings, vanishings, swift and strange, I turn to my glorious rest on thee, who art the grand reality. Reality in greatest need, Lord Jesus Christ, thou art indeed. The pilot real, who alone can uh, guide. The drifting ship through the midnight tide. He is the lifeboat real as it nears the wreck. And the saved ones leap from the parting deck. He is the haven real where the bark may flee from the autumn gales of the wild North Sea. Reality indeed art thou, my pilot, my lifeboat, haven now. And in Revelation 3.20, Christ says, he comes in, into the heart, he will be in the home of the person's heart, eating with that person. And he says, he will make that home his home. And that person will eat with him in his home. As he said, I will sup with him and he with me. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for such a wonderful Savior as Jesus Christ. Help us to learn more and more about how wonderful he is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.